This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 220, recorded on February 15th, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, Vincent. Well, we've missed you for a couple of weeks, right? Yeah, Two? three. Three weeks. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Did you did you miss us? Of course. Good. That's good. But the good thing about TWIV is that I can always listen later. Yeah, you can so. uh, vicariously join us, right? Right. You have nice, you have nice weather out there? We do. It's 29 degrees, which is minus 2 Celsius, and it's sunny. Nice. So, Thank yeah. you, too. It's very sunny. It's warmed up a bit. Mm-hmm. Also joining us today from north central Florida is Rich Condit. Howdy there, Vincent. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> How are you doing? Hi, Rich. I'm doing good. It's 80 degrees, right? Uh, no, it's not that good. It's uh, actually the temperature has been dropping the last couple of days, so it's it's chilly, <laughs> 65 degrees Fahrenheit, 18 Celsius. Ooh. Uh, clear blue sky. <laughs> it's beautiful. Also joining us today from Western Massachusetts is Alan Dove. Good to be here. How are you, Alan? Doing pretty well, and it's it's a gorgeous spring day, except for there still being a foot and a half of snow on the on the ground. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering how clobbered you got in this snowstorm. Oh, thoroughly. We got uh, we got almost three feet, I think. Yeah, uh, that's what is, I heard. Wow. Which is almost a meter for those of you in the rest of the world. Yeah, we had uh, a foot here, but it's not bad. It's almost it gone. was it was deeper than my snowblower, so I had to shovel it. Mm. Whoa. I was yeah. figuring, yeah, you were kind of right in the middle of this. Right? Yeah, I tried I tried kind of the, you know, rock the snowblower back and then down into the drift. Rich will appreciate that, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> but but nothing doing. It's just not up to the task. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have one of the little snowblowers. Here it's 12 degrees Celsius and sunny. Very nice. So I have to tell you, now that you're all on, I got a, a letter on TWIM for my other podcast. And we often do the weather there. And this guy, he hates the weather report at the beginning. <laughs> He said, I can't stand it. You guys need to stop that. And that's the only <laughs> negative we've gotten in, in all the years of doing all these things. So we really hit a nerve with someone. Well, well somebody wrote, so we, we had a letter on TWIV where somebody was complaining that we, we digress too much and, uh, and talk yeah, about Yeah, we've had a couple of those. I think that yeah. was the one we answered with the digression into stump grinding. Yeah, that was stump grinding, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I like Mark know, Twain on the weather. He said everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. Right. Yeah. Yep. Well, we are doing something about it these days, aren't we? Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. Well, and people can listen at 2x or 3x speed, you know, for yeah. the parts they want to speed through. So here's a weather-related thing I have to tell you guys, because you will appreciate this. There's a little science here. So it was it was very cold for a few weeks, freezing, and, and it's been warm lately. We have this hummingbird feeder outside, right? It has this red syrupy liquid in it. Mm-hmm. So it froze a couple of weeks ago. I noticed it was frozen. This morning, I look out, and there's a gradient because the stuff is red. The top oh. is clear, and then it gra- oh, cool. and gradient down. So I don't know if you guys ever made sucrose gradients by just filling tubes with sucrose, putting them in the freezer. Yeah. And then taking them out and let, letting them thaw slowly, it makes a natural gradient. Hmm. I've never done that. Nor, nor I. A couple of weeks ago, I was teaching my students how to pour sucrose gradients, right? And uh, I pulled out an old gradient maker. You know, I went home and told my wife about it. She said, why don't you just put the sucrose in the freezer? It makes a perfect gradient. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you, Alan, what's the basis for that? Do you know? I, I think it's that the, um, the sugar is crystallizing and... and precipitating and then resuspending when you bring it back out again. I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, this hummingbird feed, I took a picture of it. I'm going to have to put it online. Cool. It just is a beautiful gradient of that red stuff, whatever the hummingbirds. Oh, that's good. That would have saved me a ton of time in graduate school. Yeah. yeah. So you just, I think you put 40% sucrose in, and then you put it in the freezer, let it freeze, and then just let it thaw at room temperature, and then maybe do one more freeze cycle, and then you have a whole bunch, you know. Hmm. Oh, wow. No, I used to fiddle around with that little thing with the two tubes and the miniature stir bar in yeah, it. And yeah, yeah. Oh, man, it was a mess. But it's so cool, that thing. 
Oh yeah. I can't find that. We we had to use another one. I've been looking for that one. I think you took it with you, Alan. No, no, I definitely didn't take that. I do have a stapler that says uh, "Property of Mount Sinai School of Medicine." I think that may have. Yeah, hey, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> you took that from my desk. <laughs> it was on my desk, and then it. Uh, yeah, that know, was certainly mine because <laughs> I took it from Mount Sinai. Yes, <laughs> right. Well, how appropriate! One of our papers today is from Mount Sinai. Yeah. <laughs> Staple it. Make a title of the staple in Mount Sinai. Um, we do have some follow-up. Uh, one is from Mark, who writes, Dear Vincent and Company, I'm a dedicated follower and fan of your TWIV podcast, and until now haven't felt compelled to mail into the show. I just wanted to say that your most recent guest, Dr. Anthony Fauci, was fantastic. He was insightful and interesting, and I thoroughly enjoyed hearing a bit more about the clinical side of virology. I grew up in South Africa and have a special interest in HIV AIDS and its partner infections, in particular HPV, and Dr. Fauci's insights into the subject were riveting. I really hope you get him on again. I also wanted to say that your virology podcasts have influenced my decision to do an undergraduate degree in virology and immunology at the University of Bristol, England this year. I will, in fact, know if I've been accepted into the course in the next couple of weeks I look forward to learning more about the subject and will continue to be an avid fan of TWIV. It's cool. I want to second Mark's comments about the uh, the Fauci episode. I just listen, just listened to it today, and it's it's really really excellent. We let him mm-hmm. talk basically. Well, yeah, and and he's he's got fascinating insights, yeah, and it good. was it was a really really good good show. I don't know where he'll go with a TWIV bounce. He's you know pretty <laughs> pretty yeah, far yeah. up already, but you know he told us after we. Turn, after we turned the recorder off, and then we had a really good conversation. <laughs> he said five presidents have offered him the head of NIH. Because I said, what's next for you? He said, I'm right. staying here. He said, this is what he wants to do. He doesn't want to be head of NIH. Yeah, he can get more done where he is. I presume so. Uh, uh, it, it was That was a gas. It was that a was lot of fun. fun. Yeah. I was really nervous because I didn't want anything to screw up. Right. Um, speaking of uh, applying to graduate schools... So I've just interviewed four applicants to our PhD program, and three out of the four came in and go, I love TWIV. Ah, <laughs> Isn't cool. this great? Excellent. Isn't that great? Yeah. It's percolating to the undergraduate level. Mm-hmm. And then one guy wrote me an email to thank me, right? He said, from your number one fan at UCLA. <laughs> cool. Smart guy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think man, there's a selection there because we're a micro department, of course, but. I just think I never. This never happened before. Last year, nobody knew. So well, it seems I. You know, it's spreading. I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hey, Rich. Yeah. I think it's viral. Ah, that's it. <laughs> yes. Uh, Alan, can you read Jason's? Sure. Jason writes, Hi, Twivers. Wow, thanks for pick, picking my poliovirus simulation outputs as pick of the week. I'm really chuffed. Which. I guess must be a good thing. Uh, It's taken a couple of years to build these. Oh, he's from Australia. Okay. Uh, It's taken a couple of years to build these models, and they're finally at a stage where we can start doing some really interesting things with them. Some nerdy facts about the simulations. First, the virus itself, wild poliovirus type 1, takes over 1 million atoms to build, and it takes another 2 to 3 million atoms to simulate the water and ions surrounding the virus. Uh, Second, we simulate the virus using 16,000 CPU cores, but have used up to 32,000 cores, roughly 16,000 desktop computers. Uh, Third, it takes two to four weeks to perform a 0.1 microsecond simulation, depending on how much of the supercomputer we use. Um, to uh, next to render the 9,000 frames of output for the movie, it took about one minute per frame, 150 hours on my desktop computer, and two terabytes of data. Uh, and finally, if you mess up the magnesium concentration in the core of the virus, the virus explodes at three times the speed of sound, <laughs> followed by hysterical laughter at the sight of an exploding polio virus. <laughs> nice. Cheers from Melbourne, where it's 22 degrees Celsius, 72 Fahrenheit, with light, cool breeze, and not a cloud in the sky. Right, because it's summertime down there. Yeah. Chuffed is indeed British slang to be very pleased, proud, or happy with yourself. There are some less polite definitions as well but that okay. there you go jason uh is in the national intro re- reference lab down in melbourne and he had come to the u.s to visit and set up a visit and ha- sandy hit and i couldn't make it in to see oh. him mm. isn't that terrible that's awful however jason i am 
looks like I'm coming to Australia in 2014. Ooh, cool. cool. July 2014. Cool. cool. I've never been there. You guys been? No. 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 Would love to go. I think yeah, it's on, my, it's on my bucket list. Yeah. Bucket? What's the bucket? Bucket <laughs> list? What's Before that? you kick it. Oh, I see. You're being morbid like me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's not morbid. It's the way things are. Everyone says Let's, it's morbid to me. Right. Yeah, I'm always well. telling Dixon, when you die, I'm not going to replace you on TWIP. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, t- I told him yesterday we were recording one. I said, when you die, I'm not replacing you because no one can replace you. And he said, you're, you're doing a Valentine's Day thing, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rich, can you read Sean's? Sure. Sean writes, hello, Twivers. I am a plant pathology grad student slash mycolo- uh, mycologist at Wazoo. That's Washington <laughs> State University in Pullman, Washington. I'm also an avid Twiv listener. I wanted to write regarding Alexandra's question in the last episode regarding mycoviruses. While many microviruses are in fact viroids, that is, unencapsidated infectious RNA molecules, there are some true mycoviruses which, uh, which are encapsidated. There has been some very cool work done on these, especially as they relate to plant pathology and plant fungus mutualism, commensalism, parasitism. I've attached a couple of interesting papers on these topics, which I found sort of mind-blowing. I've often hoped you all would review a paper about mycoviruses or have a mycologist slash plant pathologist on the show. Please do. As for you, Alexandra, bachelor's degree time is like a freebie. Uh, Use it to get tedious classes out of the way so when you are in grad school, you can spend more time researching. Obviously, if you can, you should do research too, but there will be be plenty of time for that once you are getting your MS or PhD. Thanks for all the food food for thought. P.S. It is currently an unseasonably warm three degrees C here and raining. <clears throat> um, so, Speaking of weather reports. See, yeah. Yeah. Both, both of these emailers yeah. have the weather. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, uh, yeah, the, I'll, I'll okay. link uh, the, the papers. I think we should... Either get a mycologist, viral mycologist, or just Absolutely. do a paper. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think we've had some suggestions in the past. I have to just right. go we back. Just, we should, if we can, we should find a mycovirologist. To, yeah, there probably well, aren't Don too many Nuss, of those. Don Nuss comes to mind, but he he's okay. He doesn't want to do it. He's scared. Oh, mm. maybe he, he can recommend somebody. That's a good idea. And mm. probably when I ask him, he'll decide he's not scared anymore. That'd be good. <laughs> We're not that scary. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> All right, Kathy, can you read Doris's? Sure. Hi, Vincent. A research article, Evidence for Negative Strand RNA Virus Infection in Fungi, for one of your listeners who ask about fungal virus. And so uh, Doris includes the link to that paper. And Alexander's question was that she had, uh, this past fall, taken a course in ecology and biodiversity, and one topic we covered was kingdom fungi. I'm curious about viruses of fungi. I've heard a little about plant viruses like tobacco mosaic virus, but I've never heard of a fungal virus. So uh, we have this paper from Doris, and then she goes on. I've been listening to your podcast for nearly three years now. At first, I was reading virology papers alone. A few weeks later, I discovered TWIV at Google by chance. Back then, I remember you suggested to introduce one new virus in each future episode. Gradually, more and more guests showed up instead. What a great feeling to have wonderful companies talking about viruses. And it feels really good when TWIV actually picks the papers I am fascinated with. <laughs> Very happy to be of some help at last. But I don't know how to reach the curious mind, Alexandra. Maybe you can. And then I should read this next part of this next thing. Hmm. I will let you know if I really can get into a PhD program in virus host interaction. Cool. So I like how she capitalizes the papers. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> She says, "Good day." Is she from Australia too? I don't know. I um, I, I don't think I cut anything out of the. Okay. <clears throat> that would be if it was Australia. It would be G apostrophe D A Y. Oh, good day. Good day. Okay. Let me just look at here. I'll still look at her original email. Fungal virus. You no, know, there's no indication of. Oh, Hong Kong. Hmm. Oh. Dot HK. There you Good go. Good day, former British colony. All right. <laughs> Hong Kong. Man, Australia, Hong Kong. What was the other one? 
Washington State. Yeah, one and then one. And then Australia also. The guy had grown up yeah. in South Africa. I don't know where he is this year. Maybe he's still in South Africa. And about to go to school in England. We have a reach. We do. Yes. This is just great. All right. Let's onward to papers. The first one it was actually suggested by its lead author, Mark. A couple, I guess, on the splicing episode, right? No, the, the follow-up to the splicing, right? Because he said, hey, I have an example of where regulation of splicing is biologically important. Yeah. This is a, an article in this new journal, Cell Reports, which I guess is Cell's open access attempt, right, Alan? Which I'm very impressed that they actually did that because they're, they're part of Elsevier, <clears throat> yeah. which hates open access. Um, and and to, to see that there are, they're finally making a move. I mean, I'm sure it's based on... The, the amount of revenue that's been going to these open access journals that they'd like to try and capture. But um, whatever the motivation, at least now there are, there are articles that are cell quality papers that are coming out and, and are accessible. Yeah, so and this by one, the way, yeah. By the way, I really like the format of this with the different tabs for the text and then the figures. I think we've talked about this before. The figures over on the right-hand side with different tabs to them makes it really easy to read. It's very nicely done. You're talking about the online version, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the PDFs are all the same. Right? What is Right, the PDF is just the print version. Oh. Oh, this is a cool thing. There's a this thing called cross mark on the PDF. If you click it, it tells you if it's the most recent version of the paper, because apparently they can update them. Oh, right. uh, okay. That's interesting. New I wondered what that was. Um so I guess they're they're learning some features from um uh NCBI. Yeah. Well, I'm just cynical that they're doing this in response to the pressure, and they don't really. You know. Well, yeah, you, um, I don't think I don't think Elsevier has any serious intent of making Cell itself open access. I think this is just a a trial balloon to see if they can make a business in this. But you know, if this turns a profit and they see it as a valid business model, they may yeah. eventually get into that. Well, the paper is called Influenza A Virus Utilizes Suboptimal Splicing to Coordinate the Timing of Infection. And Mark Chua was the, is the first author. And uh, Sanja Schmid, just Jasmine Perez, Ryan Langlois, and Benjamin Tenover are the other authors. From Mount Sinai, right? That is right. My former department of microbiology. This is where I originated. <laughs> Metaphorically, of course. <clears throat> this has to do with influenza virus, and in particular, this is really neat because this was, I think, the first RNA virus shown to uh, uh, undergo sp splicing of its RNAs, right? Is that, is that uh, correct? You could, uh, it, I don't know. I think it was. You would know that better than I would. I think would. it was very surprising. Is Kathy still there? Yeah, you, the first RNA virus. Is that what you said? Yeah. Because I'm looking at your Skype, and it has a big question mark. <laughs> no, I say, I'm where's here. Kathy? <laughs> I'm here. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I think it was a big surprise when, when it was, splicing was discovered in influenza virus infected cells. I think that was Bob Lamb who did that many years ago. And um, I guess in retrospect, we shouldn't be surprised because they're mRNAs, and they can be spliced, right? Sure. And this virus, of course, uh, replicates in the nucleus. So that's probably one of the reasons why it does, right? So it can splice... It's mRNAs. That and ripping off caps. That too. Yep. Although I have to tell you, Rich, the Bunya viruses rip off caps, but they replicate in the nuke in the cytoplasm. Oh, they rip off caps from the cytoplasm. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So okay. they don't they don't splice. So I think splicing is the key. Splicing is probably the key, okay. Yeah. yeah. I like ripping off caps. That's good. <laughs> I like, it's better than cap snatching. <laughs> yeah. Ripping off caps. In fact, that could be a title for an episode one day, ripping <laughs> off caps. Uh, so flu splices two of its uh, eight RNA segments. This is a negative strand virus with eight RNA segments in the virion. And they each give rise to an mRNA in the nucleus. And two of those, uh, the M and the NS segments, or seven and eight, uh, give rise to splicing so that you can make two proteins from each segment. And this concerns this eighth segment, which encodes the NS1, the non-structural one protein, and the nuclear export protein, NEP. Also known as NS2. Right. <laughs> right. NS non-structural. 
because it's not Navirion. And um, the, the, the background here is that NS1 seems to be an, an interferon immune antagonist. You can take it, you can actually delete it from the genome and the vir- in, in interferon null cells, the virus will replicate, but in mice, the virus is much less pathogenic unless you take away interferon system from mice, like in stat null mice. I think this was the first time this was done. If you infect stat null mice with an NS1 null virus, it grows just fine and causes disease. That was a pretty interesting result many years ago. Stat, of course, is part of the signaling pathway of uh, induction of interferon-stimulated genes. Right, so if you turn off the the interferon response effectively, yeah. then this mutant virus can grow. So NS1 is this sort of protein that need, really you need in, a, in an animal or anywhere there's interferon, <clears throat> so it's not needed for fundamental replication, although some people will argue that it is, I'm sure. <clears throat> and the NEP, however, is needed in every cell because it's needed to export the uh, RNA or RNPs, ribonuclear proteins, from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And uh, so I want to make sure I understand clearly what the splicing arrangement is here. The splice um, winds up incorporating uh, a few amino acids in con- uh, of the NS1 N terminus, correct? Right. That's correct. And then splices into an acceptor site that is uh, nominally in the coding region still of NS1. Right. Uh, and but out of frame. That's right. So, uh, so the resulting NEP uh, NS slash NS two protein has a few amino acids in common with the N terminus of NS one, but then the C terminus is a different coding sequence. Right. So there's right. a stretch here of uh, nucleic acid in com- uh, coding nucleic acid in common between NS one and NEP where. Uh, two different reading frames are used. Yeah, that's right. right. Wow. Yeah, well, I think it's 10 amino acids at the end terminus of NEP are, from, are the same as NS1. Okay. And then the rest, I put a little picture in that I stole. Yeah, I was looking at that. That's, that a, that's a nice diagram. So uh, the NA, so the, what happens is that splice site that gives rise to NEP apparently is not very efficient. It's a crappy splice, splice site. We're going to find out in this paper why. Which is really neat. Yeah. Um, so um, the question here is: crappy is a pretty subjective term. I know. I, I know. I know. You know, I inefficient. Agree. I would say. Yes. The, even we call, even that's subjective. Well, look at the title of this paper: <laughs> utilizes suboptimal splicing. Can't we call okay. it crappy splicing? <laughs> I think we should, you know, that would really attract undergraduates to research. I think, I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> Can we put it in the title? I think, well, I, we ought to write in and change the title of the paper. <laughs> well, it's, they could do that. Um, <laughs> subjective is a problem. I agree. I complained about it recently. It's good. It's good. I like it. <clears throat> um, the question is whether you need, to, so why is the NS, NEP splice like crappy? Is that important? <laughs> Right. <laughs> That's the question. Yeah, as, <laughs> as it turns out, crappy is just right. Yeah, yes. right. It's Maybe some, that ought to be a title. Sometimes crappy <laughs> is good. <laughs> That's right. Oh, we're on a roll. Maybe we should, <laughs> you know, separate for weeks at a time. Come you back have been again. listening to. Right? <laughs> just quit now while we're ahead. Yeah, really. Right. All right, so they, they do a bunch of cool experiments. This is really pretty neat. A lot of neat yeah. engineering in this paper, which... Yeah. Uh, this is just amazing what you could do with infectious DNA clones of viruses. Mm-hmm. Isn't it something? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first thing they do is... Um, Otherwise known as... No, no, no. Nothing else. It's infectious clones of viruses. Okay. <laughs> well, you could say it, but... No, I'm not going to say I'm it. Not gonna, I'm not going to take part in that. Probably no one knows what we're talking about, but that's fine. <laughs> no, the fans do. <clears throat> yeah. They do this cool thing where they, they, they put a microRNA target sequence into the three prime non-coding region of NS1 in a virus, right? So and if you look at the figure of, of the way NS1 and NEP are spliced, you can see that NS1 has some unique three prime non-coding sequence in the message. So they could selectively knock down NS1 mRNA with the microRNA, right? So they, they use cells that 
express uh, a, a certain microRNA, and they put the target sequence in the three prime UTR, and that that way, when the virus infects the cells that are making the microRNA, it destroys most of the NS1 mRNA. Right? Isn't that cool? I yeah. I just I, this is the kind of stuff that you know I really just have to believe in microRNAs. This works all the time. <laughs> right. yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, and in fact, um, so microRNAs are are uh, the way these things work is that they bind the RNA and then an enzyme called Dicer comes along and chops up RNA that has this Myrna bound to it, right? Yep, that's right. right. So you Which target, then forms yeah. a nice control because they also use cells that lack Dicer to prove that that's in fact yeah. what's going on with yeah, these. Yeah, so you could put a scrambled microRNA target <clears throat> just to make sure that mucking with the 3' prime non-coding region isn't what's giving you your phenotype. And this isn't it's even terrible. artificially messing with uh, with the microRNAs. This is taking cells that naturally either do or do not express different microRNAs. Yeah, that's right. So I think I'm overthinking this, but where, if I'm looking at this figure that you have, it's a, mm. where did they put their target sequence? So you see there's some 3' prime non-coding in NS1 that is not present in NEP because it's the coding sequence, right? Right, but by putting the microRNA in, won't that still oh, I see be complementary to yeah. the NEPNS2? Yeah, so there's uh, a, they've uh, rearranged the whole thing. They've re reconstructed this gene. Look at supplementary figure one. Yeah, figure S1. Okay, they basically you. separated, as I understand it oh, from this right, figure, they right, basically right. separated the coding regions for NEP and NS1, so they're no longer overlapping. Yeah. That's right. And, okay. and have the uh, splice sites in there. Now they can stick the target sequences in between those two. Yeah. Right. right. So they can they can turn off just NS1. Right. right. That's, that's as good. Vincent yeah. said, this is heavy duty engineering. Yes. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Um, and then the the effect is you make a virus that has vastly reduced NS1, but NP NEP is is normal. It's not affected because that's what they'd like to know. If you muck with the the ratio, is it a, is it a problem or not? And you can they do a growth curve, and you can see that. You can bring down NP NS1 in this way, and the virus replicates fine. And they and they knocked it down. They say 90%. I'm looking at these gels, and it's uh, some of the lanes is just gone. Yeah. I mean, NS1 is just way, way, way down, and the virus is fine. Right. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely... As, um, importantly, they have a deletion in NS1 yes. as a control, and that guy is dead. Yes. Yeah, so they, right. that's because these cells uh, make interferon. That's probably why. Right, so if you have if you have zero NS1, that's a problem. But if you have just a little bit of it, everything's fine. And and yet the virus makes this yeah, right. vast excess of it. Right, because they say now that they can measure uh, whether NS1 is present or not by looking at expression of an interferon stimulated gene. And they say that uh, you know there's still uh, there's no difference in uh, in one of these interferon stimulated genes. So that says that the amount of NS1 that's there is enough to do its job as an antagonist. Right, and, and that normally the virus is making a huge excess of it. Right. So low levels of NS1 are enough. Right. Um, the next thing they do is to, um, now that they make another kind of virus, which has another cool expression, uh, regulator, which is one where they're making a really low amount of NEP, um, and so they basically make a virus. Instead of splicing to make NEP, it's going to be making it by this 2A sequence from a picornavirus, which is basically a ribosome stop and reinitiate sequence. They, they call it stop carry on because that's the British way of saying it, yes. carry on. <laughs> so basically it's a short sequence, and apparently the ribosome reaches the sequence, it stops translating, and then it starts again, and you get two proteins. Right, so people use this to make two proteins from a single mRNA. It's very useful. I'm seeing it more and more. So they can do this to make a virus that makes a very low amount of NEP, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And that, that virus is sick. It's got yeah. impaired replication. And then they do this. They do a similar thing by knocking down NEP with siRNAs. And again, you get low replication. So basically, if you don't have enough NEP, it's bad for the virus. So there's not an excess of NEP being made. Right. On the other hand, if they overexpress NEP in virus, which they can do by at making additional copies, you know, adding additional copies to the virions, that's bad too, which is interesting. You make too much NEP, you, you also get reduced virus yields. 
Mm -hmm. Right, and they do all this by sticking this stuff in the HA gene. So they have an basically an yeah. extra genic NEP, right. and then using uh, using as a host cells that express the HA, so that you can get along without that. Yeah, weird. It's very very uh, a lot of engineering here. Yep. Yes. Yep. And then the last thing is they muck with the splice site. So well, you, actually, they fix it. <laughs> they fix it, right. <laughs> it was crappy, and now they made it work great. Yeah, they right. made a, a, a nice uh, splice site. And I think when we talked about splicing, we talked about how surrounding sequences can affect splicing efficiency. Well, if we didn't, yeah. here it is. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I guess, um, does anyone remember how they optimized the splice site, what they did exactly? Uh, I'm not remembering this, right offhand. Yeah, this was a a little bit tricky because they um, mm. they had this issue um, where they wanted to be able to read through. Um, oh yeah, NS is made as a read through. Yeah. So basically, you're getting mostly spliced product made. Right, so if you, if you yeah. just fix the splice site, you screw up the sequence of NS1. So they had to do some some sort of tricks to make sure that they would get a functional NS1 as well as NEP yeah. while fixing the splice site. Anyway, so the basic result is you make mostly NEP. But um, this, this virus makes a lot less NS1 as you would expect, but apparently um, that doesn't affect the virus replication. It's still making enough to... Uh, so I think they tried it with an NS1 complementing line. It didn't complement the defect. So the problem is making too much NEP by optimizing the splice site. Right. So you optimize the splice site, and now the virus is sick again. Right. So that, again, they use the induction of an ISG MX1 to confirm that enough NS1 is made to be biologically relevant. Right. But fixing the splice site, and it mucks up replication. Right. And, and their, their thought is that, and they show this, that when you make too much... NEP too early in infection, you export all the pre. You get premature export of the RNPs, the viral RNPs, out of the nucleus, right? right. Yeah, that's the money figure. Figure uh, this is the real biological issue. Figure four E is the uh, confocal uh, micrographs that uh, show this, where they're uh, staining for nuclear protein and for DNA. Uh, in both the uh, optimized splice, the, the under and over expressing NEP, yeah. and looking for export of nucleocapsid by tracking NP from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And uh, it's apparently regulated. It's either too early or too late, depending on whether you have too much or too little um, uh, NEP. Right. And I mm -hmm. think there's some implication that the NEP is involved in this switch from making mRNA to genomes, right, to genome right. replication. And so this is mucking it up. But I can imagine that's going to be a, the topic of another paper because they can look at that, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So the idea is that you make very little NEP because of this crappy splice site, and it slowly accumulates. And during that time, the virus is making messenger RNAs early on, which it needs to do to make a lot of proteins so it can get replication going. And then only later, when you've got high levels of NEP, then the genomes go out so that you can start you can start replicating, and you get the switch from mRNA synthesis to replication, and then you can start packaging. So there's a sort of a timer, right? And the amount of NEP that accumulates is a function of the efficiency of the splicing. Yeah. Now, what I think is really cool is that, and they say this, so all the eight segments have the same efficiency promoter. So if you need to regulate one of the proteins, like NEP, the only way you can do it is, well, this, this way is one way to do it, splicing, right? Re regulating the efficiency of splicing. Vary the degree of crappiness. Degree of crappiness. There may be other ways, but <laughs> this is what the virus has evolved to do. Now, here's the thing that's weird to me. So NS1 is, as a consequence, overproduced, right? Mm -hmm. Because... The splice, the crappy splicing makes you make a lot more NS1. And they say it's like an order of magnitude more than you actually need to replicate. But they say it's not an error because that's sort of needed to make a small amount of NEP. Right, right. Do you think that's okay? I just find it weird that you would make extra stuff and 
just for something else. I don't know. Uh, it's a bureaucracy, remember. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this is, it's not perfect. Yeah, the, okay. the, the virus is severely constrained. It has very limited genome to, to yeah, mutate suppose, and evolve yeah. with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and it's in there in the nucleus where the promoters are fixed at a particular level of output. Yeah. Um, and now it's got this NS1 NEP combination, and it's got to make less NEP so it accumulates more gradually. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to regulate this splice site, and so what if it gets too much NS1? It's importantly relevant to this question, they actually we kind of skipped over this, but in figure two, they actually took these uh, NS1 mutants and infected mice. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, right, and yes. showed that And showed that they were still, it's not just in cell culture, it's even in mice. Yes. They replicate okay. Yeah. Okay? So not only do you not need the full complement of NS1 in cell culture, you don't even need it in mice. Right. right. That have an intact uh, interferon system. I was and impressed with the. I was impressed mm -hmm. with the fact that they could uh, do the assays on the infected mice and look at the uh, levels of expression of these things in the lungs. Yeah. yeah, Vincent, and this isn't that much different from other viruses that make a huge excess of some of their structural proteins or things like that. Mm. I mean, you know, there's viruses can be wasteful in order to get enough of some of the stuff they need. See, my error is to. Uh, anthropomorphize and look at it yes. from a human <laughs> point of view. And I always tell you? people, don't do it. It's wrong. You're going to make errors. And there you go. That's an example of why. Well, I mean, that's why I point out that it's a bureaucracy because yeah. even if you if you really anthropomorphize, you will realize that humans are sloppy as well. Yes. <laughs> okay. Are you serious? <laughs> Listen, you work in a university. You know about yeah. this. Of course. <laughs> so, so where this sent me off on a tangent was trying to remember, okay, there's some flu that only has seven segments. Does it still have this segment? So then I had to Google and find which flu only has seven segments, and it led me right to your blog, Vincent, <laughs> <laughs> talking about uh, influenza C, which indeed only has seven segments, and it has the segment that does this same yeah. NS1 NEP thing. But I hadn't realized that it doesn't have two segments to make an HA and an NA. Influenza C has this combined. Yeah, has combined hemagglutinin surface. esterase. Yeah, that, that um, was just news to me. Look at this. If you search, if you Google influenza C, I'm the second hit. Hmm. My search engine optimization is working. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but but that isn't even what I searched. But but <laughs> so now that took me down this path of influenza C. How much of a problem is it? It's not in the vaccines. What you know? See, it's, do it's no problem at all. Apparently, there's no, there's hardly any. You know, as far as we know, there's hardly any influenza C caused disease. Okay. And I was taught that as a graduate student. That's what everyone said. There's hardly anything. Yeah. It's like asymptomatic most of the time, so we don't put it in the vaccine. Okay. I, mean, I did notice that the reference strain is C Ann Arbor. Yeah, that's so. right. Oh. A lot so. of well, you know, there was uh, Masab in Ann Arbor for many years, right? Who named Masab? Yeah. Yep. Did you know that? that oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So he did. In fact, the, the flu mist strains originated in his lab. Because mm -hmm. when I was a graduate student, he was publishing them. Mm -hmm. And this is the funny thing, just to take a little diversion, which I know we don't do, but <laughs> when I was a so student, scientific. he was, this is a scientific diversion. When I was a student, he was developing these cold adapted strains of flu to make a vaccine. Cool. Okay. Then, uh, what was the name of that company? Aviron was made first? Uh, Aviron was first, yes. So Aviron, they started this company. We're going to make a genetically engineered flu vaccine, brand new. What do they end up doing? They, they license Masab strains, yeah. you know, because they couldn't come up with something on their own. Right. And that was the beginning of flu mist, basically. You know, so it's cool. Mm -hmm. All right. I worked on flu C as, a, as part of my thesis. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. And uh, did the first RNA gels and showed that there were seven RNAs, not um, not eight. So that was uh, so cool. I went away for a minute. Which segment is missing? The uh, well, it's got a combined hemagglutinin esterase instead of a separate hemagglutinin neuraminidase. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, but it's got this uh, spliced guy, so right. I guess it's important for all because B's got eight segments like A. So mm -hmm. it's neat. Nice story, Mark. Yeah. Very nice. Yep. Bringing Great. it to us attention. I hope we did better than the uh, these um, news outlets that you didn't like. 
<laughs> Scientists thwart flu by resetting its clock. <laughs> well, we're we're more entertaining anyway. They're not thwarting Wait, it. Where was the thwarting? I missed that. Yeah, they're the... just trying to figure out. <laughs> study shows how flu keeps time. Now, that's a little better, right? That's better. Mm -hmm. It would actually be interesting to know sort of the evolution of uh, of this work because there's a lot of tinkering of the different genes that goes on. And I, I can imagine that if you were trying to figure out how to, uh, in this splice thing where there's a lot of overlap, uh, it's hard to... Uh, mess up one without messing up the other. So the yeah. The, yeah. the 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 evolution of the uh, work must have been very interesting. Uh, let me tell you something. It's just, this is also cool. Um, the NEP, its role was studied by a former student of mine who went to Peter Palazzi's lab and did a postdoc, uh, Bob O'Neill, and he's cited several times yeah. in this paper. So they've been interested in this issue for a while, and and uh, the 10 overlap, of course, is in the same department as, as Palazzi. And so I, my feeling is they must talk about this. And and, mm -hmm. and Peter had not worked on it in a while. And Ben probably said, hey, what, why don't we do this? You know, figure out why there's uh, this regulation event. Why is the splice site crappy? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this, let's do the virus a favor and fix it. And the virus said, yeah. don't do me any favors. There's a the BBC article says flu virus knows when to attack. The virus has a built-in clock which tells it exactly when to strike to have maximum impact. <sighs> okay. The internal clock tells the flu bug how much time it has to multiply, infect other cells, and spread to another human being. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think that's right. Wow. That's, I would, actually, I, don't, I think there, there was, must have been a press release about this. I don't remember probably yeah. delving into it, but it would be interesting to see how close ah. to reality the press release was because that can yeah. actually be a source of error too mm -hmm. yes i'm glad you always defend the writers because you are no right. i don't always defend the writers <laughs> i mean these <laughs> these news stories by the way they're crappy um they're <laughs> well and some of it could be blamed on the headline writers right yes the headline writers are often the bigger part of the problem but you know this description that vincent just read is uh, that's off base that's not what the virus is doing the last two paragraphs of this BBC article, they interviewed Wendy Barclay, who was chair of flu virology at Imperial College London, who we had on TWIV in Dublin, by the way. She said, uh, flu is clever that it can do it in a simple way. It's tempting to speculate that drugs might be developed that disrupt the regulation of these two proteins. But she cautioned against being too enthusiastic because flu virus may well find a way to reset its timer. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right? In fact, it would I would be surprised if they're not trying to pass this virus with the optimized splice site and see if it reverts or changes, right? Mm -hmm. Good idea. Uh, mm. By the way, I've traced the uh the problem you just identified in the BBC. Yeah, I thought uh, yeah. Um so the press release from Mount Sinai. Oh, uh according to researchers at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, the flu knows how much time it has to multiply, infect other cells and spread to another human being. Mm. Okay. Yeah, if it leaves a cell too soon, the virus is too weak. If it leaves too late, the immune system has time to kill the virus. Oh, dear. It's problematic. So, yeah, so that's where often this sort of thing <laughs> starts. And now, of course, the reporter at the BBC in a perfect world would have called around and, and read the paper and would have gotten to the bottom of things and maybe not just gone with what the press release Alan, said as the explanation. Alan, Alan, the solution is why don't you just write all the articles? <laughs> there we go. You could be rich, and, and all the science would be right. And I would have no time for anything, yeah. What do you need to do? Oh, <laughs> shovel your driveway. That's yes, right. right. I've got to shovel my driveway. <laughs> all right. Sorry. But if we had, we could clone you. Right. Because we know okay. you can write. Okay, let's go on to um, our second paper, which is really cool. I think... I guess McFadden brought it to your attention, right? McFadden brought it to my attention, and I put it in the queue. Yeah, and my next-door neighbor, who's a phage uh, microbiologist, brought it to my attention. So, yeah. The bacteriophage T7 virion undergoes extensive structural remodeling during infection. Bo Hu, William Margolin, Ian Molyneux, and Jun Liu. And uh, 
Rich, did you work on T7 or? I did my graduate uh, my graduate work on T7, and I'm still. This is home for me. I'm still in love. I never got over it. <laughs> I'm I'm still in love with this thing. You uh, must this really just love really, this. It's a science paper oh, of all things, right? This is just. It's. Uh, I just. This is breaking my heart. <laughs> I love it. It's amazing. <laughs> it's very cool. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. And actually. Uh, I do not know these other. I do not know most of the authors, but Ian Molyneux was um, at the uh, MRC Mill Hill while I was at the ICRF. So I used to get together with him occasionally while he was there. And in fact, he's done a lot of work that was a continuation of my uh, thesis project. Uh, so I've been uh, occasionally in touch with uh, with Ian, and it's good to uh, see them capitalize on this. This is just beautiful stuff. So this is interesting. Maybe most people, when they think of bacteriophages, they think of the uh, the lambdoid phages with a long tail and an icosahedral head or a long mm -hmm. neck, I guess. And or T four. The lambdoid T4. phages have a kind of a flexible tail. T four is right, the yeah. classic, with a long, rigid tail and a base plate and these tail fibers sticking out. You know. And they have right. a spike that jams through the uh, the membrane. Mm -hmm. That spike recently crystallized by the way it's very cool but t7 is sh has a short tail right which is mm -hmm. not doesn't contract stubby thing. Yeah. And, it, and it's not even long enough to go through the membrane mm -hmm. which is part of the problem right that people are trying to figure out so this is neat because they use a uh, cryoelectron tomography to capture shots of the of t7 infecting e coli and then they put them all together to make a movie mm -hmm. of of infection which is really neat and um uh, cryo-electron tomography. I, when I first heard of this a few years ago, I said, well, what's the difference between that and cryo-electron microscopy, which maybe some of you know has been used to solve structures of, of various viruses. And initially the, the resolution wasn't that great, but now it's getting very good. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, wasn't it we did the ADNO paper a long time ago where one group did it by cryo-EM and another did it by X-ray crystallography. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they were... Uh, They're comparable. Uh, I, uh, comparable. There was, there, I've even heard some comment that the cryo-EM structure is even... Uh, well, it's as good, if not better, than the uh, X-ray yeah. crystallography. There, there was more detail from the cryo-EM. In fact, that was in the commentary as well from the yeah, ADNO that's right. work. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah. So in cryo EM, you base well in all in both of these cryo uh, approaches, you freeze the specimen in water, and that gives it enough contrast so that when you photograph it under the EM, you can you can see the image. But in cryo EM, you take lots of photographs, and the idea is that each particle is in a different rotation, and you can assemble them computationally to make a three dimensional image. Does that sound good? Yeah. Um. Uh yeah I yeah that's a, that that's reasonable and then cryo et um you basically freeze it and tilt the platform so it's sort of like being in a cat scan except you're moving the the patient instead of the X ray machine so you tilt the platform so you can get different angles right. And that's mm -hmm. the tomographic, and, and you can from do those different. So, uh, with a with a tomogram, uh, tilting the stage in different angles, okay, you can get a uh, a three D reconstruction from a single particle. You don't have to do the averaging, okay. Right. Um, and so that's one of the you can you can get um, uh, a structure on an asymmetric particle or an asymmetric structure by doing the uh, the tomography. And they have a variation on this theme here that they call, what is it, um, uh, dual axis? Is that what they called it? Uh, darn. What's here? It's in, um, <clears throat> it's in figure two, I think. Um, I will I will come back to it, but uh, where they actually oh it's in the supplementary figures, uh, where they actually take uh, they take two tomograms of the same particle. One is slightly rotated to the, uh, relative to the other because the problem with the tomography is that you can't tilt the stage all the way through 180 degrees. Right. You're mm -hmm. missing about right. 30 degrees. Right. But right. if you take the same sample and rotate it just a bit and do the same thing, you can basically make up for that deficiency if you combine the two uh, images. 
Right. One thing you said, though, Vincent, um, freezing them in water doesn't give you the contrast. In fact, um, they don't have much. The benign preservation in the water, um, because of no staining, doesn't give you very much contrast. So they have to do some other things. Um, and that's described in the uh, uh, article that uh, Rich gave us about tomography. So they... Uh, uh, what are the things? I was on, for one cryo, of them is uh, they I, do high D focus. They uh, filter out inelastically scattered electrons. Oh yeah, so yeah, that's that's one of the ways in cryo EM is to get some contrast by making it unfocused, right? But right. I, they don't add any stains, uh, right? Right. No. Right. Not like a like a traditional EM, a transmission right. EM. They don't need stains, right. right? They use the inherent contrast, right? Yeah. Yeah, and they use high <clears throat> accelerating voltages to get increased penetration. Yeah. So yeah. those are some of the ways. So, so dual, a dual axis tomography, that's the name Dual of it. axis, that's cool. Dual axis, where you take the two different images, one rotated relative to the other. Yeah. So essentially, they, as you said, Rich, they can take single <laughs> images and rotate them, tilt the table, and get a three-dimensional reconstruction from that. And they have... The three stages of infection here, they have adsorption of phage to the outer membrane, and then you can see the um, tail going through the outer membrane, so it's, it extends from the head, and then the DNA is gone. Yeah. DNA ejection. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's just... This is, it's, it's all right there in figure 1ABC. Yeah. Yeah. That's very so, cool. Uh, another thing that's uh, interesting about this paper is that they use E. coli mini cells, yeah. which right. I... I remembered hearing about it as a graduate student. I don't think I've thought of them in almost 30 years. <laughs> but they're, uh, they're very, very small, about one four hundredth the size of an E. coli cell. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the phage is so big relative to what you're seeing as E. coli. And um, they're very thin. Um, mm -hmm. So that uh, allows them to uh, do these experiments. Right, it gives them, gives them the image of the membrane that they need to, to get this resolution, I yeah, think. to get maximum right. resolution, yeah. Right. So, the, so then the other cool thing is they can see the um, the density of the fibers, right? Mm -hmm. And um, they're unusual because they're folded up against the capsid. You know, you will often think of fibers as, like in the as you said, in T4, right? They're kind of hanging out there. Well, maybe they're not in yeah, T4 maybe even. They're not. Why did we put them that way? From the EMs, right? Yeah. Right, from the EMs. Yeah. yeah, so in some cases they're out there, but maybe in, in an infection they're not. Who knows, right? But they they could reconstruct the fibers right up against the bottom of the, the capsid. And they I guess they have some crystal structure of um, the fiber protein. They could fit it into the density, mm -hmm. which is pretty neat. And then they find that uh, these fibers are changing conformation, right, sort of on a constant at a constant rate as the virus is just floating around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in the free particles, they can, uh, most of the fibers are uh, folded up against the capsid, but right. there are a subset of capsids that have one or two fibers uh, kind of sticking out. But when the thing is actually affixed to the cell and is ready to inject its DNA, all of the fibers are down contacting the cell. Right. Right, so they have this this model where the the phage collides with a cell and then kind of does this random okay. movement over the surface until it settles down in a spot and the fibers extend down and then yep. then the tail protrudes. Yeah, so figure four is that nice summary where they support it by the cryo ET images. Yeah, which boy, <laughs> you'd have to look at a lot of those, I guess, because. Um, I'd ha I mean, I wouldn't look at them and say, "Oh, yeah, that's what's happening." But as Alan said, the phage kind of bumps into the surface and starts rolling along and walk or walking, looking for the right receptor. Yeah, they, call it, they call it a random walk, where yeah. right. one or two fibers are down, and and actually, there's a great animation of this that's actually on YouTube. Yes, uh, yes. Right. that animates the whole process. There's this random walk, and then it sits down. Yeah. So. so uh, I did find where they say maintaining tail fibers on the body of free virions may thus be typical of many phages because yeah. they talk about that. And um, we kind of uh, already skipped over uh, figure three where they show this core and uh, it's in figure three. You can see it in those pictures. And they tell you that the amount of material that's in this core is just enough 
to make the extended part of the tail that it needs to be able to get to go through the membrane. So the core, right. is, the core is stored in the head, right? Right. 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 Yeah, and it goes out. So the trigger for that is probably the tails all sitting down at the or the receptor on the bacterial surface. Good yeah, question. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure that they, they don't specifically know, but address that, but pretty much when you see, for instance, in three A, the core is there, and then three C, uh, you've already made that tail into toward the inner membrane and yeah. beyond, yeah. and uh, the DNA is gone. So or, it, walk, it walks. Or along no, the DNA is not gone. I think the DNA right. is still there. And then on right. its way. Soon. Right. It walks along the surface of the cell. It finally sets down all uh, six feet. Then it ejects this core through the membrane, and that forms the tube, and then it injects the DNA. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And there's actually two different uh, uh, cryo EM techniques here. Uh, one is the tomography, where they can get reconstructions of individual particles. And they also use asymmetric reconstructions mm -hmm. uh, to get uh, uh, higher, high resolution images, in particular of the uh, tail fibers up against the capsid. And that's where you take um, uh, thousands yeah, yeah. of I images and you sort them out into subgroups depending on what you think is what's going on and then use uh, software to uh, line them up as best you can and average them and uh, uh, get a higher resolution image out the other end. They also do a fair amount of discussion of how does this uh, tail complex which has six uh, fibers how does that interact with the five-fold symmetry axis mm -hmm. and and that was pretty interesting and then and then one of my favorite things to see was in figure, it's a supplemental figure 2, D and E, where there's these little star particles that are spontaneously released tail complexes. They're just beautiful. They're, I, I, yeah. This whole paper. just <laughs> Figure 2, I, D I like and E? Figure S2, supplemental oh, 2. S2, okay. That's yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and then some of these movies, um, so there's several movies involved with this paper, and some of them, I, I want to point out, I'm going to do this when I do it with my students in class. Although you think that you're looking a, at a sequence in time, you're not. You're actually looking at a, a sequence in space because you're going through different planes yeah, of, yeah. of looking at these particles. Right, um, when you and, put and, together, sorry. Yeah, so anyway, so yeah, so they have to, and then they put together at least one of the movies to look like you're seeing um, uh, you know, building that extra uh, tail through the membrane and stuff, but that's actually different particles that they've put together into right. that movie. Sure, sure. So, yeah, you can't you can't make a movie looking at this in real time because it's all frozen, right? Right. <laughs> right. I think they ought to do this with T four and see if the fibers are hanging around or folded Absolutely. up like this, right? That would be Absolutely. interesting to do. Yeah. Yeah. This got so a lot I, of yeah. I can't look at this without thinking of the lunar lander. I mean, that's to me uh, what totally, this is all about. totally. Yeah. It looks exactly like the eagle has landed on this on this little mini cell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Who was first? Phage was first. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> um, this got some a lot of publicity just a, a while ago. It came out in October, and I remember seeing these movies everywhere, which is great. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's really cool that people um, get exposed to this. And hope they understand what it is. Oh. It's nice work. All right. Anything else? No, oh, that's good. Good. It's yep. okay, Rich. We want to do yep. T7 I, well, you know. It's okay. It's okay. I'm coming back. I got picks here. Okay. Yeah. And, that, and I, just... I think the most important thing <laughs> is, the, is the YouTube video. for the If nothing else, yes. for the listeners, right. look at the YouTube video that tells the story. And it, it is fun to go back to the original uh, data and see, you know, uh, I mean, this is very visual so that you can go back and look at the original uh, electron micrographs and see uh, how it is that they constructed the, the video. Yeah. 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 And it's and it's a heck of a lot. Of, I mean, the figure three, they're talking about uh, this is an average from 3,300 virions. Virion, uh, this other one's from uh, 1,800 virions. So they're they're collating an enormous amount of information, but the pictures mm -hmm. really do tell the story. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's do some emails here. Uh, Rich, why don't you take this first one? Sydney? From Sydney, yes. 
Sydney writes, hello, Vincent et al. I just wanted to thank you for responding to my letter on the show a few episodes back. I was the student pursuing a master's in entomology and was confused about my qualifications for a PhD in virology next fall. After listening to your advice, I recently applied to University of Maryland, UPenn, Boston University. Keep your fingers crossed for me. I wanted to draw your attention to something that might be interesting for Twim and Twiv. I especially think it's something Rich might like due to his fascination with polydenoviruses. The link will direct you to a paper describing an obligate intracellular bacteria, Wolbachia, and its ability to induce resistance to dengue virus in Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Wolbachia is estimated to be present in greater than 70% of insects, making it one of the most common parasitic microbes on the planet. In mosquitoes, Wolbachia in induces an interesting uh, reproductive phenotype termed cytoplasmic incompatibility, where females infected with Wolbachia can produce viable offspring with both Wolbachia infected and uninfected males. However, uninfected females can only produce viable offspring with uninfected males. A lock and key analogy <clears throat> is typically used to describe this phenomenon. Male sperm is locked by Wolbachia and only females infected with the same Wolbachia can unlock the sperm. Ultimately, this gives Wolbachia infected females a two to one reproductive advantage over uninfected females in a population. This has spurred interest in using Wolbachia to replace wild type populations with a mosquito population that has a gene genes of interest. The story is complicated, so I hope you understand the general idea. Actually, that's very well described. Yes. Uh, what I wanted to point out to you was that new research shows us that Wolbachia not only alters reproductive phenotypes, but other physiological aspects of the insect as well. One of the newer findings is that Wolbachia seems to bolster the insect's immune responses to some viruses. I've attached a paper where researchers in Australia had released Wolbachia-infected mosquitoes to suppress dengue transmission in the field. I thought the discussion of this topic might be timely and could spark conversation about cross-disciplinary collaboration for those listeners who enjoy virology in, conduction, in conjunction with another area of study. I work with bed bugs now, so this uh, topic, mosquitoes, used uh, to be my uh, area of specialization. Hope you all find it as interesting as I do, Sydney. And she's got a couple of links to articles, which, in fact, we uh, discussed at least the topic, if not those articles specifically. We did those articles specifically, didn't we? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. In uh, 12147. <clears throat> right. So if you want to hear the hear us uh, try and do in an hour what she did in a couple of paragraphs here. You're welcome to go back and listen to TWIV 147. Huh. Great. Yeah, she's going to put us yeah. out of business. Very, huh? yeah, yeah. very interesting. <laughs> All right. Um, Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Sasha writes, Hello, professors. It's been a while since my last letter by the name of Sasha on episode 178, but I've since become more of a virology geek turned programmer than the other way around. The tragic suicide of Aaron Schwartz on January 11th involving his alleged intent to release documents from JSTOR has sparked a response which I think the scientific community at large should know about, PDF Tribute, uh, which is also a hashtag on Twitter. Um, researchers in all fields of science have begun to release their papers on Twitter, open access under that hashtag. There's speculation elsewhere in the tubes that this response to Schwartz's death might lead to the rise of alternative publishing models, such as those in PLOS One. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, and I'd like to close with a quote attributed to the late activist, which I heartily agree with and hope you'll enjoy the same. Be curious. Read widely. Try more things. I think a lot of what people call intelligence boils down to curiosity. What do you think about this, uh, you know, stimulating alternative publishing models, Alan? Um, well, first of all, it's it's really tragic that this this incredibly promising fellow killed himself. Um and uh, I, I think there's been a lot of trying to read motive into that. Um, I, I don't know how much of that is accurate. And, of course, we don't have Aaron Schwartz's input on what exactly was going through his head. Um, it has kind of, um, kind of sharpened the tone of some of the discussion about open access. I 
think, though, that that conversation was already very far along. I mean, we have PLOS One, we have multiple open access journals and different business models that are being explored. Um, and as we just talked about, uh, even even Elsevier is now exploring open access. This is being vac- taken very, very seriously. Um, so, I, I don't know. I think it's I think it's gotten a lot of commentary online. I don't know how much difference that that will actually make in a process that was already ongoing. Yeah, that's my feeling. It's it's going. It's we're moving towards that open area. So I doubt that this is going to make a difference. But uh, yeah, it is unfortunate. And my understanding is that the U.S. you know going after him was may have been a precipitator in him doing this, which is really sad. I mean, they that, really that wanted- was certain that was a major stressor in his life. I'm I'm very very hesitant to assign blame for suicide, but yeah. because apparently he did download many millions of articles from JSTOR. He oh yeah, he did it. Yeah, he did a very um, openly uh, deliberate yeah. act of civil disobedience by downloading and and releasing these articles from JSTOR because he felt that they should be yeah they should be opened up. Yeah. Um, but the the government going after him with a huge. Uh, you know, jail. Yeah, the U.S. Attorney's Office went after him Crazy. very aggressively in the in the wake of that. Yeah, it's too bad. I had come across a quote of his uh, not too long ago, and you know, I also wrote about it, so I'll put a link to that. Yeah, he said some cool things about curiosity. He's a yeah. smart guy. All right, Kathy, can you take our last one from Chris? Sure. Chris writes, Happy New Year, Twivers. Oh, dear. I have written to Twiv before. Well, you know, it's just Chinese New Year on Sunday, so it's fine. <laughs> oh, that's it. Yes. Yeah. Year of the snake. Okay. So we're good. I have written to Twiv before to share my science-related movies. Thus, I'd like to thank you for discussing my movies during the show. It's a huge honor to have the Twiv team simply mentioning them, let alone discussing them during the show. Thank you so much indeed. I come here today to share my opinion on the Tamiflu issue involving the Cochrane collaboration and Roche. As I mentioned before, I'm a virus researcher currently working on my second postdoc at the University of Otago in New Zealand. Prior to this position, I was employed as a researcher by a private company involved in the business of cancer detection using molecular biomarkers. Despite resenting having working for this particular company from a career perspective, career's perspective, I must admit that the experience I gathered was invaluable. As you'd expect from a company involved in population diagnosis, we had to tip our toes into the world of clinical trials, which is an experience I doubt I'd have had in the academic sector. Comprehensive clinical trials are very complicated, multifaceted, horrendously expensive, and thus unaffordable, untenable to most academic labs. Once immersed into the world clinical of cl- clinical trials, I quickly realized that the system is flawed, to say the least. To be succinct, novel drugs that enter clinical trials are often, one, compared to placebo, in other words, drugs are compared to nothing as opposed to the best medication currently available on the market, two, trialed in a small sample group, two to three thousand is usually the magic number, and three, trialed for a short period of time, six months to one year. Other problems include the sample group may not include a comprehensive representation of the population ethnicity. The safety of the drug is often established is established based on basic physiological symptoms such as blood pressure and cholesterol levels and or cholesterol levels, leaving side effects to be detected well after the drug has been put on the market. From the top of my head, I can cite the string of anti-obesity drugs such as dexfenfluramine and fenfluramine, both removed from the U.S. market in 1997 following revolts resu- reports of valvular heart disease and pulmonary hypertension, as well as sibutramine, removed in 2010 because of increased risk of myocardial infarction and stroke, non-randomized and or blinded trials, failure to report negative results or results that don't conform with the expected clinical outcome. The Cochrane collaboration versus Roach saga regarding the full disclosure of all clinical trials involving Tamiflu is a well-documented case that has parallels with other drugs removed from the shelves soon after they have been approved for commercialization. It's the case of another anti-obesity drug known as Ramanabond, despite known a bit, knowing a bit about anti-obesity drugs, I'm not obese. I'm even shorter than Alan, five foot seven inches, but I'm 78 kilograms, <laughs> and a black belt instructor of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, eight minus. <laughs> by, by, by the way, when did I become the standard for short? I, I think this, <laughs> this is just out of that conversation where I noted that Rich was particularly tall. Yeah, yeah. people got I, it. I am average height, by the way. I'm five nine. <laughs> Ah, okay. 
<laughs> but he's he's shorter than you are. No, he's, he's Vincent's height. He's short. Right. He's <laughs> but he's not he's not obese. He just knows about these drugs. Yes, yes. So the Cochrane Collaboration wanted to investigate the safety of Rumanaban as there were anecdotal reports in Europe that the drug caused adverse mental effects on patients. Thus, the Cochrane Group requested that the pharma company hand in all the results of the clinical trials involving the drug. As expected, the company said no. Over three years, repeated requests from the Cochrane Collection were met with negative results, and each time the company would cite different reasons for not disclosing the results. Eventually, the drug was taken off the shelves by the pharma, as it was found to increase the risk of suicides. Did the pharma company know that, th know that during their clinical trials? To this date, we still don't know. Hmm. The fact that negative results are not likely to be published is not new in science, and in my view, plain wrong. Nevertheless, not being able to test or investigate someone else's finding goes contrary to the scientific methodology. How would you react if you have a colleague who publishes several papers on a supposed novel virus, which is not known to other research teams, nobody else has it, nobody can test the findings, and he tells you that you can't have that virus and you have to take his or her word for that? Well, in fact, there's this, I don't know if it's written or unwritten rule in science, but that you know, if you publish something, you're supposed to be willing to share that. So um, it's hard to imagine this kind of situation um, in in uh, theory. Mm, um, right. In real life, we all know that, yes, you can write to someone and ask for their published reagent, and you might not get it, or you get it after many years. But I believe um, some journals do have this as a written policy. That uh, Matter of fact, I'm sure of this, that uh, if you publish something in their journal, uh, that uh, that makes it, basically public right. and you have you're to obliged make to give it out you have yeah. to make right. not everybody complies with that but that's the that's the written rule right okay so uh let's see i'm yeah Sure, if you really wanted to know the safety and efficacy of a given drug, you could do it yourself. You could set up a team and apply for funding to conduct clinical trials on that drug. However, unless you have a gigantic money sequoia growing in your lab, that will never happen. In case you do, could you please spare a couple of seeds? <laughs> yeah, I'd like that money sequoia too. Thus, the most affordable way to investigate one's claims in this context is to request that the results of the clinical trials be shared so they can be independently investigated. Enter the Cochrane Collaboration. They are an independent nonprofit organization consisting of a group of over 28,000 volunteers in more than 100 countries set to organize medical research information in a systematic way in the interests of evidence-based medicine. Quick disclaimer, I'm not part of the Cochrane Collaboration. I don't get funded by them. I don't even know anybody who's part of that initiative. I'm just aware of them. A couple of quick points. I'm afraid I'll have to disagree with Alan's comment regarding loss of qualitative power if you have to strip some info from the patient's records. Blinding trials is relatively straightforward and, in fact, should be a standard operative procedure in any reputable clinical trial. The argument of sensitive info in patients' records falling into the wrong hands is usually mentioned in these situations. However, there are several mechanisms one can use to ensure that identifiable information be treated sensibly. These include a wide variety of solutions, including encryption and or legal processes. If I could just break here, um, mm -hmm. I suggest you do some reading in the, in the information security literature, um, particularly as they pertain to medical records. It turns out that uh, stripping data to anonymize them is a much, much more complicated problem than you might imagine. Um, and there have recently been a number of analyses of, of supposedly anonymized data that have been able to fairly easily calculate who was in a particular data set. Um, so what you think is anonymized is not necessarily. And if a company releases the data that they have and it is possible to, uh, this is separate from blinding, by the way, for, for control purposes, that's relatively straightforward. Um, but anonymizing data for release is much more complex. If the company tries to anonymize the data, first of all, that costs them time and money to do, which uh, I don't imagine the Cochrane collaboration is going to pay for. Um, and secondly, if they do try to anonymize the data and then send it out, and then somehow uh, people can get individually identifiable, identifiable medical information out of those data, the company is on the hook mm. for liability and at least in the U.S. under a law called HIPAA, that includes not only civil liability but criminal liability. So they could go to prison for <laughs> releasing the data without the very, very careful um, anonymization. Oh. Hmm. 
Just just pointing that out. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> okay, back to Chris's letter. Finally, I accept that it's often private money that funds these expensive clinical trials and that the data generated belongs to the company. The problem arises when that clinical data is used to persuade governments around the world to stockpile a given drug. Fifteen years of experience in science have taught me to be skeptical. If you say something is that good, prove it. If you've got nothing to hide, then show it. Let science have its final say. Thank you very much for your efforts in communicating science. Like everyone else here, I simply love the show and can't get enough of it. Sorry for disagreeing. Blame it on my short man <laughs> syndrome. <laughs> Best regards, Cristiano. P.S. Did Dick make it to New Zealand? How was it? Please let us know in advance when the Twivers are coming <laughs> to our town. Sorry, I forgot to mention the weather. Weather in Dunedin, 18 Celsius. Unusually bright blue sky. Ta. Uh, the, uh, yeah, actually, thank you for disagreeing. Uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, is obvi this is and, obviously a complex issue. Yeah, and I think I, I, and we mentioned a couple of these points um, of the the other side of the argument, um, including the issue that you know the the private company has funded this; they do own the data. There, the system for policing this is the regulatory agencies that are responsible for approving these drugs. Mm. Um, so the idea is that the company submits their data to the FDA and the, uh, the EMA, um, and the, you know, other regulatory bodies around the world. And these agencies, which are, which are run by democratically elected governments, they're appointed officials, but the, ultimately the people are in charge, um, those agencies are responsible for scrutinizing those data and they do, um, the, the FDA is walking a fine line. On the one hand, people want the new drugs to cure the diseases, and on the other hand, they've got to keep things safe, and sometimes they get it wrong. Um, but that's the mechanism that we have, and for, uh, for the Cochrane collaboration that's a private nonprofit to come forward and say, give us all your data, um, that's, that's asking a lot of a company. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> I think it's great to disagree. I think everybody benefits from a discussion. Yeah, so you don't have and, to apologize at all. And and I think you know you make a lot of good points. And if we could somehow get these data, um, in a more, if we could somehow make this process more open than it already is, yeah. uh, I'd be in favor. Well, one of the things that's really uh, coming home to me through these discussions is that it seems to me that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to actually construct a clinical trial that is uh, going to reveal uh, side effects that are, uh, you know, happen very infrequently. Yeah. Right. You have to kind of do the best you can and then, uh, uh, I almost hate to say it, but kind of put it out there and cross your fingers. How much and, do you uh, want your clinical trial to cost? Yeah. Well, yeah, and how much is practical to do? I mean, we see yeah. this in the uh, in the uh, vaccine uh, uh, situation. You know, there are minor uh, or infrequent uh, side effects that uh, that come up uh, only yeah. when uh, uh, something is released on a mass scale. Narcolepsy, yeah. right? In certain yeah, that's exactly yeah, what I was thinking. Narcolepsy. Who's going to enlist twenty thousand fins in every study yeah, to get that that? genetic hey, sample you would or, have you would have no drugs or vaccines then right? yeah and there and there are some areas of medicine that are real black holes for this sort of thing um pediatric drugs yeah there's a lot of stuff that's used in kids that's never been tested directly in kids because who's gonna who's gonna go for that clinical well, there, trial there's a population pregnant women where you get no drugs pregnant women nobody... you get no drugs approved for them exactly yeah. right i so I, it's a very difficult problem yeah. you know i wouldn't worry about the the anti-flu, anti-neuromididase inhibitors. Just go listen to what Tony Fauci said, right, Rich? Right. Yeah. He just said they're not so great. Don't worry. They're not so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's and and I think even on, on some level, the companies would even acknowledge that. Yeah. I, I think they're fine for someone who's deathly ill, an older person or a younger person. There's nothing else you can do. They come in, you know, with with flu, and you try an antiviral, but it's not just for prophylaxis. No good. They're, they're kind of like the vaccine, you know. They're they're nothing special, but they're all we've got. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Chris, for that. Yeah, that's great. And uh, let's move on to some picks of the week. We'll, we'll let Alan go first because you have to leave soon, right? Right. Okay. Just in case got? we run over. 
Uh, my pick is a brand new open access journal. Now, of course, that's not news in itself because these come out every 15 seconds. I think there's a new open access journal. But this one has what I think is a, a unique business model. Um, instead of charging a page fee for each article that you publish, and that's one of the issues with open access publishing. Somebody still has to keep the lights on. Somebody has to pay the bills. Um, and so in open access, usually that's done by the authors of the paper paying the publication for publishing. And then instead of charging for subscriptions, they make it free to everybody. So in the subscriber pays model, the authors don't have to pay. Uh, this is a new journal called Peer J, and they've... Um, They've done a couple of interesting things. They're trying to make peer review uh, more transparent. Um, they're also, they have this neat approach where you can pay a single lifetime fee and then you can submit your papers to them for no additional charge for the rest of your life. Hmm. Or for the rest of Peer J's life, if this doesn't work out. <laughs> uh, so you're taking a little bit of a chance. But they've got some neat stuff in their inaugural issue. Uh, and they've got uh, a lot of the players behind it are, are you know, know what they're doing. Um, so it, it looks like it's off to an interesting start. So every author needs to pay 99 bucks or just... I $99? think, I'm not sure exactly how that okay. works. All right. Tim O'Reilly. Sits on the governing yeah. board. Hmm. Yeah, so for ninety nine bucks, you can submit your papers to uh, to this thing. Yeah, J um, uh, Peter Binfield, who was previously at Plus One, uh, Jason Hoyt, who was um, uh, at Mendeley, which is the, the citation manager. Yeah. Um, well, I would... man, ninety nine bucks doesn't seem like much. No, no. But I don't want the, the journal to fold in a year. Then your paper's right. gone, right? Right, so right. So what do you do? I mean, it, I would like to help them, but I'm not sure I want to send a paper there. Yeah, now I, I assume that these are going to be archived, um, sort of the archive of last resort would be um, PubMed. PubMed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they would still have your paper online. Okay. Um, and it, as I say, it looks like, at least initially, they've got some cool stuff. It's like a very eclectic collection of Extremely. science. Extremely. Yes, so they've got a pain medicine thing, a uh, perceptual uh, psychology paper, a, a paleontology paper, a bunch of stuff. And I think the idea is they're they're staking out their territory as all of science. So yeah. they would be they would be uh, you know the nature of or the right. plus, okay like, yeah plus one type of thing. Right. All right. Well, we'll see what cool. happens. Yeah. We'll see when we do our first paper from Peer J, right? That's right. <laughs> You're on mm -hmm. All right, uh, Kathy, what do you have? Well, I picked the Journal of Virology Cover Image Gallery. So I'm a dinosaur, and I still get the hard copy of the journal. <laughs> and um, the one that just came has this really cool photograph of bacteriophage TP901-1 infecting a lactococcus lactus cell. So, uh, oh, yeah. That, that is very made me, cool. That made me think uh, they must have a way to just look at all the cover images. So I was just now trying to recreate how that happens. So if you click on the link, then you need to click down below on the year. So you click on 2013, mm. and then you get the whole set of images. And you can um, – the previous one was a, a set of uh, yeah. hearts <laughs> in four yeah. colors. Cool. And, um, and, and it gives you the caption, and it's – Mm -hmm. uh, mouse airways after a SARS coronavirus infection, but obviously just <laughs> happened to look heart shaped and yes. they've false colored them in, in four colors. And this isn't the first time that there's been a Valentine themed JVI cover. <laughs> um, and I remember writing to Dan DeMeo, the uh, photo editor for Journal of Virology, and commenting to it, him about it. And he said, I think you're about the only one who notices these covers, Kathy. <laughs> so, um, hmm. and then there was. There have been a couple of Halloween-themed ones. Um, and so for those of you that don't get the hard copy, you can just come and, and browse this uh, gallery every now and then. And it's interesting just to find out what the pictures are, I think. So. Cool. So uh, did you know that I was the first cover editor of Journal of Virology? Is that I, right? I did not. So if you go that. back to the first ones in 2005, I picked all those for like three years or something, yeah. Wow. Ah. Didn't know that. You were yeah. the cover guy. I was the cover guy, yeah. 
Yep, I used to pick the covers. I see some of these. I remember them. Yeah, it's changed, though. They've gotten more ambitious. Yeah. That's cool. Nice gallery. Yeah. Good. And I wrote to Virology, too, but I haven't heard back from them. So if I do, I'll, I'll let you know cool. to see if they have a similar yeah. kind of thing. Rich, what do you have for us? So uh, the T7 article kind of got the juices flowing in me. Mm-hmm. You know, I was, you know, all reminiscing and et cetera. And uh, uh, the granddaddy of T7, in my mind, is uh, Bill Studier, uh, F.W. Studier, who really uh, put it uh, on the map by doing uh, the classical genetic analysis of T7. And so although these are behind a paywall, I'm hoping that uh, some people can see them. At least the links are there so they can, or the references are there. These are, in my mind, two of the really classic papers from uh, uh, Bill's lab. He's the sole author on both of them. One is a 1969 paper from uh, virology called The Genetics and Physiology of Bacteriophage T7, where he describes the isolation and complementation analysis and recombination mapping of, I believe it's about 400 amber mutants of T7. Um, And uh, that defines the basic set of essential genes, which at the time was uh, 19. That's of course, with sequence and further analysis, uh, been expanded. But it also made available uh, to guys like me a complete genetic toolkit for studying T7. And I used all these mutants uh, in my graduate work. And it basically, uh, you know, Bill's my hero. It's basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, for, was formulative in making me a, a scientist. The second paper is... A 1973 publication called Analysis of Bacteriophage T7 Early RNAs and Proteins on Slab Gels. And one of the things that I th- is most remarkable about this is that this, is, this introduced to the scientific community the notion of uh, running slab gels. I mean, every, to, nowadays, everybody's uh, slab is redundant. All gels are slab gels, okay? Yeah. But up until this time, people ran individual samples on gels that were uh, formed in tubes and then if you wanted to look at multiple samples you had to get these gels out of the tubes and line them all up and hope they all lined up okay and uh, Bill actually he credits somebody else with uh, uh, the initial uh, invention and says he just elaborated on it but it really uh, sort of brought it out in the open Uh, uh, Bill um Uh, popularized running slab gels. And what's cool about this paper is it describes in excruciating detail (laughs) how to make these things. And figure one is actually a picture of the apparatus. Because, of course, you couldn't buy them. All right? Right. He had them made in his shop. All right? And everybody, you know, copied his design and went out and made these things in their shops. And then ultimately down the road, uh, companies picked this up and... um, and made their own uh, slab two, gel. Pa- two panes of double strength window glass. Yeah, yeah. it's it's wonderful. Yeah, I used yeah. to cut my own. Uh, I used to. It, it, he had him. Yeah, I used to cut my own notched plates and that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, and you know why notched plates? Why those parts always broke off? It, it has to do with how glass breaks, hmm. and so those kinds of right angle turns are what are called impossible cuts in uh, glass blowing or uh, stained glass. And so Tiffany glass had a lot of so-called impossible cuts hmm. in his things. So, um, but yeah, those were always the most fragile parts. Well, the- I can certainly attest to the notion that those are impossible cuts because I made a lot of glass plates in my time and those were very difficult to make those notch <laughs> plates. Yeah. Um, uh, and I, actually one little uh, aside that's entertaining uh, in those uh, in that first paper and in several subsequent papers, uh, uh, Bill published his gels with the high molecular weight species on the bottom. Yeah, right. And I the noticed. low molecular weight on the top. Yeah. So I always had to read his journals upside down uh, to, yeah. to interpret them. It drove me crazy. Yeah. And he eventually flipped them around. That's so cool. uh, hats off to Bill. Here's you know a, 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 a shout out. These are wonderful papers. Nice. Just one other aside about tube gels, Rich, when you're saying you had to line them up. I actually had, uh, I ran samples that had radioactive uh, samples in them. Mm. And so we would put them in a little uh, aluminum trough, put that on dry ice to freeze them. And then we had a bank of razor blades all screwed together, equal distance apart. And then we would cut the gel and then 
uh, take the little pieces of gel out from between each pair of razor blades, put that in a scintillation counter, and count it. Yep. 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 And, uh, yep. Oh, yeah. And I was just thinking as I was describing this, it's actually kind of come full circle because a lot of the sequencing now, of course, is done on capillary gels. Yep. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. That's right. Alan, you need to go? Yes, I have to take off. All right. Alan Dove Bye, Alan. is at alandove.com. Take care. All right. Thank always you. a pleasure. Bye bye. Bye. All right. My pick is Virologia in Espanol. My uh, colleague down in Mexico, Susana Lopez, uh, has gotten her lab members together and they're translating my undergraduate virology lectures into Spanish. Unbelievable. What a task. So they wow. translate all the slides. They rewrite them. I send them my slide stacks. They stand, translate all the things they can translate on the slides. Some of the figures, obviously, are, can't be translated. But then they, they transcribe what I say, and then they record it in Spanish. Unbelievable. Wow. This is some work. So I yeah. thought I, thought I want to highlight their effort because this is really good, and it really opens up uh, the course to Spanish-speaking people, of course. Which so, is about half the world, right? Yeah, so this is really cool. And mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping someday to get it into Chinese and Russian and Portuguese, and then we'll basically have most of the world, right? That's what I understand. Anyway, so thanks very much to those folks uh, who are doing that, Susanna, of course. And let's see who else is here Daniela, Rosa, Liliana, Alfonso, and Eugenio. So we'll put a link to that. She's gonna, she wants me to put one up every two weeks to give him time to finish. So the first one's up. Great. We have a listener pick of the week from Dave. As an educator, I would love to be able to hand out models of virus capsids or protein structures while teaching related topics. Until recently, 3D printed models have been expensive and delicate. Thus, it would be difficult to have enough models for small groups of students to use. New inexpensive 3D printers, MakerBot.com, and many others that deposit melted ABS plastic have come on the market recently and are quite usable for making these models. Thingiverse is a site where public domain creations are made available for 3D printing, among other things. Below are links to virus structure and protein domain models I have printed and I use in my teaching of biochemistry. So this is cool. He makes yeah. viruses yeah. and proteins out of these. And I got one of these. Actually, so Dave is at, um, oh, darn, where, where is he? Uh, I should know. He was the, my, my, I have a student in my lab who, uh, Michael, who was, was an undergrad at this institution and um, worked in his lab. We are actually collaborating now. So he teaches undergraduates, and this is, he makes these models to give to them. Let me let me tell you where he's from because this would be terrible if I didn't. It's a small college, not too far from Madison. You probably know it, Kathy. Um, let's see. His name is David Hall. He actually posted this on our Facebook page. He is at Lawrence College. Oh, at Lawrence. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. that? Probably not yep. too not too far from you. Mm -hmm. All right. So thank you, Dave, for that. This is cool. I wish I could buy one of these. This, these things are still one or two grand. And um, I, don't, I think that's a bit much. But there are supposed to be sites where you can go uh, and use their 3D printer. That's right. So I haven't found them. Yeah, I they must have them in New York. So. Uh, look around. Look around Columbia. You know, I yeah. I, I was actually look. There's a uh, a lab at UF. Yeah. Where they have 3D printers and you and you can use them. I'll bet you there's somewhere in Columbia where they've got 3D printers you can use. Yeah, I would love to give these out, right? Make virus models and give them to your students. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. take an icosahedron home tonight and study it. <laughs> mm -hmm. That would be fun. Anyway, so this is cool. He got uh, he got the, them to buy one out at Lawrence, so that's good. Yeah, uh, for for his teaching, so that makes perfect sense because he does it every year and he can hand out the models, so that's great. So thanks for that, Dave. That will do it for Twiv two two zero. You can find us at twiv.tv, iTunes, and microworld.org slash twiv. And if you like us, go over to iTunes and uh, leave a comment or rate us. That helps to keep us visible. And we do love to get your questions and comments. Please send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. 
Thanks. It's good to be back. I had a lot of fun. You back with us for a while? I think so. Yep. Okay, good. And Rich Condit is down in Florida at the University of Florida Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. It's always a good time. Great and to be here. Uh, you are not here next week. I'm not here next week. And then, you know, then I'm here. And then when March rolls around, it's going to get crazy again because. I'm going to miss a couple there, but right. we'll okay. see. We'll address that when we get there. See, Alan Dove is out next week as well, so it's Rack and Yellow and Spindler. Okay. All right. I think we did one together once, too, before, right? We did. We did. And then a time when Alan dropped out a lot. So, yeah, <laughs> that was an accidental, <laughs> just the two of us. Right. I'm Vincent Rack and Yellow. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. El Profesor de Verola here del Mundo!